Welcome to Future Hindsight, a podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for you and me. I'm Mila Atmos. This week, we're taking a little break, and so we're reaching back into our archive to bring you one of our all-time favorite interviews on the podcast with Anat Shankar Osorio, who is just a political messaging and data wizard who we spoke to back in February of 2022. Listening to this interview post-2022 midterms was almost better than the first time around because it's all so relevant to where our heads need to be as 2024 approaches. Let me know if you feel the same way. You can get in touch at hello at futurehindsight.com or I'm on Twitter at Mila Atmos. That's M-I-L-A-A-T-M-O-S. And we always love to hear from you. The really central idea of this podcast, the big idea, is civic engagement, those action items that we can get done that support a vibrant, inclusive democracy. Civics is something that you do rather than something you study in ninth grade and leave at the classroom door. And so I'm really interested in thinking about how we can be empowered to stay engaged and excited about civic life. And I'm really interested in how we can do a better job of talking about that. How can we better communicate how vital it is to participate? And one of the main action items to support democracy is, of course, voting. I'm not just talking about voting in general elections, but voting down ticket. At school board elections, county judge and town supervisor elections, and registering to vote, helping other people to register to vote, how can we do a better job of talking about that? There's only one person I want to help me figure out some of those answers, and that is today's guest, Anat Schenker Osorio, host of Words to Win By, a podcast about progressive wins. Anat, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. First, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah. So I do empirical testing and research and analysis to try to figure out why it is that certain messages resonate where others falter. So I will analyze current discourse on some issue looking at how advocacy talks about it, how the opposition, media, where it is applicable, popular culture, and then look for patterns in language to understand what are the metaphors at play, what are the frame semantics, how is it construed on the left, how is it construed on the right, and from there draw hypotheses around, oh, it seems like this is a problematic metaphor. And if we keep talking in this way, it will lead people to conclusions that are not progressive. And then from there, we do testing. We actually create different kinds sometimes of experiments, which I can describe, and then sometimes more traditional testing that I think listeners will be more used to, like surveys, online dial surveys. We also do qualitative research to try to figure out what are the wording choices, orderings, and images that will be of greatest impact. And then finally, because it turns out to not be enough to just do giant research projects and hand people talking points, say this, don't say that, I actually help create full-on campaigns. So that means digital ads, memes, slogans, branding, color choices, in order to bring that better messaging to life. So if we start with my premise, which is that we need to find better ways of talking about voting, do we do a good enough job talking about voting? I feel like we're not. So first, let's just state what is likely obvious, which is, That when we are in an era, at least in the United States, in which we have one party that is acting as a political party, i.e. attempting to court voters, and then we have essentially a faction that is trying to keep people from voting, some of our issue is not a messaging problem. No one in any place should be standing in line for any number of hours in order to exercise their most basic and fundamental rights. So I do want to say that. And the stuff that is under our control, i.e. how we speak about this incredibly important act of voting, the words that we use, the images, the choices that we make. So yes, we need to be doing a better job 
And the first thing that we need to recognize, and this is hard for deeply politically engaged people to believe, but what all of the research and experimentation over decades, because voting behavior is one of the most studied aspects of political communications, what we know of voting behavior is that it's actually a matter of habituation. I like to tell people that vote is a verb. It's an action that we need people to take rather than a belief that we need people to hold. And so oftentimes we think, oh, the message should be about this issue. We will talk about the climate or we will talk about reproductive rights or we will talk about schools and we will target that to this particular population that cares most about that issue. And that seems like a totally valid hypothesis that you should, you know, find that issue sweet spot or we'll have candidate focused messaging and that's what will drive people out. But in point of fact, what we find, at the risk of sounding just tautological, people who vote vote and people who don't vote don't vote. It's a little bit like flossing. So it's really more, is this your habit or isn't this? And so what that means is that the most effective way to get more people to vote more habitually is actually to talk about voting. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So, well, who is doing a good job talking about voting? I think if we look at what just happened in the last two U.S. elections, so I'm speaking about 2020 and 2018, what we saw is, and, you know, how many times can we overuse and abuse this word during the course of the Trump years and the pandemic? So apologies, but unprecedented. (laughs) unprecedented turnout. And when I say unprecedented turnout, when you look at the numbers over time since folks have been measuring turnout in elections, so going way, way, way back, the bump up in 18 and 20 is double the size of any previous bump up. So we're talking about sort of like lightning strike kind of change in level of participation. Why was that? Well, part of that, of course, was being in decided opposition to Trump. But we also need to note that turnout was up in 2020 among all sorts of voters. Turnout was up all around. So we look at who was doing a good job, who was truly well and mobilizing people. Well, let's look at the states that we flipped. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia. Georgia. What did they say to people? In the recall, which happened in January after the November election, they said to voters, our work is not done yet. Our work is not done yet is a voter agency message. It is a message that positions as the central figure in the frame Not the party, not the candidate, not the opposing party, nor the threat from the opposing party, but the voter themselves. And so what effective voter messaging does is it builds a sense of agency and it speaks to the voter about their own power. So for example, in 2020, we turned out in record numbers and we delivered stimulus checks and lifted however many million kids out of poverty. And in 22, we're going to do it again. You are the vital voters that are going to deliver for this country, rather than XYZ party is going to deliver for you. Mm, That's uh, very powerful. Like you said, it empowers the voter. It puts the onus on taking action onto the voter to come to the poll and cast a ballot. So in January... Despite President Biden finally seeming to put voting rights near the top of his agenda, legislation to protect the vote failed in the Senate. And it seems to me that a select few here in the United States are panicked about the state of our democracy. But I think most Americans are shrugging it off, even though you just said that a lot of people came out to vote. I also think that the fact that the media says it's a loss for Democrats as opposed to a loss for democracy doesn't help us. How can we communicate the urgency of our situation to help voters understand what the stakes really are? 
It's such a good question. And there are so many layers to unpack in this onion. First, let's just underscore how absolutely devastating it is that let's just be upfront and bold faced about it. Democrats win by courting our votes and Republicans win by keeping us from voting. They know it. They are aware they have absolutely nothing to offer people. They stand against us being able to provide for our families, being able to get care that we can rely upon and not get sick when we think about the bill. They stand against us having air to breathe, literally. So when you have absolutely nothing to offer voters, you have to do one of two things, and Republicans are doing both. One is oldest trick in the book, divide in order to conquer, race baiting, fear mongering, scapegoating, as they've always done. And two, you have to silence the voices of Black, Indigenous, Young, and New Americans, because you can't court voters. So you have to keep people from voting. And that is the reality. So what do we do about that? It's hard. If I had a magical, perfect answer, I promise I would give it to you. <laughs> I would like that to be the case. But here's what we know. We know, number one, and again, this is through the frequent testing that we're doing all the time, nearly daily at this point. Talking about democracy in and of itself, that word, isn't that effective. Democracy is an abstraction. I often like to tell people democracy never bought me dinner. It doesn't feel tangible to people. And also, again, some hard truth time. We've never lived in a democracy. We've never had one. We don't have one now. We don't have one now because of gerrymandering. We don't have one now because the Senate, as we know, is a fundamentally anti-democratic institution. We don't have one now because of present voter suppression. Democracy is too important a concept to talk about with unconvincing words like democracy. So instead... We want to talk about, as we renamed the bill, and quite deliberately so, the freedom to vote. Freedom, 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 freedom. When we do testing and we ask Americans, what is the value you most closely associate with the United States across the board, demographics, geographics, income, race, background, generation, etc., the number one value people most closely associate with America is freedom. And for too long, the left has let the right own this value and pretend that they are the sort of arbiters of and the defenders of freedom. But in point of fact, some of the greatest progressive victories, not just of our lifetime, but of generations past, have been framed as freedom, right? The freedom riders during the civil rights movement, the freedom to marry. Freedom is core to how we got suffrage for women, that is a fundamental value that we can't give away. So one thing is to talk about having the freedom to decide for yourself, having the freedom to determine who will govern in your name, having the freedom of an equal say in the decisions that impact our lives. And then the second thing is that we always have to tie voting back to the outcome of voting. Voting is a process process messages are generally less successful than outcome messages. The freedom to vote means deciding what our schools will look like, whether our roads will be paved, and whether we'll have hospitals in our rural areas. The freedom to vote means that your kids can be cared for, that you have enough to put food on the table and are home in time to eat it. So it's connecting that act of voting back to what gets delivered. I guess the second part to that question about how we talk about voting rights, and it is what voters of color or poor voters have known for a long time, you know, that voting is hard, like the process of voting is hard. You maybe have to stand in line for hours, you know, because of voter suppression. And uh, maybe your right to vote is questioned when you show up, your registration is thrown out because of a typo. And more and more are coming to experience this reality. How can we communicate about voter suppression in a way that does not discourage voters, that encourages voters to come out despite the difficulties? Yeah, this is such an incredibly important question. And 
if I may, when we were in the 2020 election and it was still sort of what we now know is the early days of the pandemic, we didn't know that they would be early days, we encountered this exact problem where, on the one hand, we wanted to tell people about all the machinations Republicans were doing with the post office and DeJoy. And you remember, I'm sure, the post office boxes, those big blue things being taken away and all of the subversion of actually how the post office operates to delay mail and so on. So on the one hand, we wanted to talk about this giant threat to the entire postal system. And we wanted to tell a bunch of voters who newly could vote by mail in the midst of a pandemic when we were being told to stay away from other people, understandably so, hey, you should vote by mail. So basically, the post office is totally screwed. It's really messed up. You cannot trust it. Also, you should use the post office to vote. So I'm very familiar with this conundrum, and we are very much in this conundrum right now where we want to do both of these things that you just described. So how do we do it? Well, we very carefully recognize that there are different kinds of negative messages. There are different kinds of ways of framing something negative, something bad, something that's being taken away from you, something that is harmful to you. The most common way and the unfortunate default, because it does not work, is to use fear-based messaging. The effective way is to spur defiance. So the difference between those two things, to illustrate in a for-example message and we've done lots of field experiments on that, would be the difference between saying, for example, Republicans are trying to silence our voices and they're taking away our vote and they're making it impossible for us to even have a say, so you should vote. (laughs) Versus in 2020, we turned out in record numbers despite this pandemic and we delivered stimulus checks for our people. If anyone thinks they're going to silence our voices and sabotage our elections, they've got another thing coming. We're Americans, not Americans. And we know that anything that is worth doing is hard and that any step toward progress is always met with resistance. We have not yet even begun to fight, and we will show up and show out to elect real leaders who govern in our name and enact our interests. So yes, they are doing this thing. Yes, we are going to tell you about this thing, but it's inspiring that sort of F you very much as opposed to the like, ugh, are you kidding this thing too? Or what I like to call, boy, have I got a problem for you messaging, which is not effective. Mm -hmm. What you said in your example is actually only a little bit about what they're doing, but primarily about what you're about to do. You're only saying, oh, they're trying to suppress our vote or they're doing it, basically. But most of what you said is about what you're doing with your vote. So speaking of voter suppression, there is a growing threat of election subversion. And as we learned, of course, on January 6th of twenty. 21, there was a plot to overturn the results of the 2020 election. And we all know that fact checking is incredibly boring. But in the meantime, (laughs) Democrats and Republicans are calling completely different things the big lie. You know, what the Democrats say it is is different from how Republicans are using it. So how do we fight election subversion with no agreed facts? Oh, It is very, very difficult. You're absolutely right. One thing that I want to pick apart, the adherence to the real big lie that there was any kind of malfeasance in the 2020 election when, in fact, it was the most observed, the most counted, the most verified election that we've ever had in our lifetimes. Yes, we see that around 30% of American voters actually continue to believe that not only was there some form of manipulation, but that it was enough to actually have an impact in the results. And of course, the majority of Republicans by quite a bit believe that. But when you actually unpack it, let's just take my home state, I don't live there anymore, but I'm from there, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, 
there are people who live in Wisconsin who fundamentally cannot wrap their brain around the fact that the majority of people, by a very slim margin, but still the majority of people, the majority of Wisconsinites, rejected Donald Trump. That is the thing that they cannot conceive. They cannot conceive that the majority of their neighbors picked Joe Biden and did not pick Donald Trump, especially because they picked Donald Trump, the slim, slim majority of them in 2016. And, you know, we could say this about Michigan, we could say this about Pennsylvania, Georgia, etc. And because they live in these communities where everyone around them also voted for Trump. So they're simply like, well, who are these people in Wisconsin or in Michigan or in Pennsylvania? Pick your state. I don't know any of them. They don't go to my church. They're not at my kid's school. You know, they're not at the fish fry. I'm still using the Wisconsin example. Like, what are you talking about? I've never met them. And so when you live surrounded by a reality, which is then at odds with what you see as an outcome, then you have to come up with some sort of causal explanation. And quote unquote, helpfully, Donald Trump and his lying enablers came up with an explanation for them. It's not, in fact, that this is what occurred. In fact, something else nefarious was going on. So I think one of the mistakes that we've made is we've actually not attempted to message about that. We've accepted the opposition's terms, and now we're going to fight about them. So they're going to say there was the F word, fraud. There was fraud, there was fraud. And because of the illusory truth effect, which is a cognitive bias that causes us to rate things that are more familiar. So things that are repeated, people are more likely to believe them to be true if they feel familiar. It's one of many cognitive biases that is why repetition is so incredibly important in messaging. So They say there was fraud, there was fraud, there was fraud. And what do we say? We say there was no fraud. There was no fraud detected. We conducted extensive investigations and the instances of fraud were blah, 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 blah. Did I say fraud again? Have I mentioned fraud? There was no fraud. Can I say fraud again? How about I say it some more? And so first of all, in negating the other side, we are actually reinforcing their argument because we are, again, in this case, for example, using the F word. But even more broadly, Even if we were to make the first immediate fix, the first immediate fix is to say not there is no fraud, but rather this was the most observed, recounted, well-administered, and verified election of our lifetimes. And every trusted election administrator from across parties has reaffirmed the correct result. So you say what did happen. You don't push back against what didn't happen. But even with that, what we actually need to be saying is Joe Biden won by a greater margin of popular votes than ever in our history. Joe Biden won more popular votes than any person running in our history. Joe Biden was elected by record numbers of Americans, Americans across race and place, big cities, small ones, suburbs, farms, picked Joe Biden to be our leader. That's what we needed to have been saying. We are taking a quick break to share about a podcast called The Catch. And when we come back, Anat's going to help me figure out when going negative works and when it doesn't. It's pretty good advice for life in general and politics in particular. But first... This season on The Catch, I head to the upper Gulf of California for a look at the shrimp industry and the efforts to make it more sustainable and less harmful to marine life and to fishing communities. Join me on my journey as I hear directly from fishers, environmentalists, and officials about efforts to untangle the mess and hopefully revive this area that Jacques Cousteau called the Aquarium of the World. Check out The Catch Season 2 wherever you get your podcasts. And now let's head back to our conversation with Anat Schenker Osorio. So you talked about the big lie and fraud and a lot of the messaging that's coming from the right, which is primarily negative, right? And like you said, we just take their language and try to debunk it as opposed to having our own messaging on the left. So... 
why is negative messaging so effective? And what's the antidote? I'm glad you asked this question because this confuses people a lot. They're like, will they use fear? Will they use negative messaging? Why are you saying it doesn't work? So to get flippant for a minute, you wouldn't use the same message to sell a black woman a sports car as you would use to sell a white man a sports drink. We're selling two different products to two different audiences. So that first and foremost. To some degree, we do have the same task, right? The task is 50% plus one. The task is engage your base and get them to repeat, 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 repeat in order to persuade the middle, because that's how persuasion actually works. If people in the middle don't hear your message, it is by definition not persuasive. A message no one hears did not persuade them. That feels like a pretty uncontroversial statement. So... Negative messaging is effective on the right because they need to rile up their base in order to persuade the middle. And their base, by definition, are people who are inherently conservative, for whom certain kinds of buttons, certain kinds of psychological triggers, etc. work. We need to rile up, engage, and maintain our base to not just believe us, but to be our choir, to repeat, repeat, repeat. So their base gets excited about drain the swamp and build the wall and, you know, punish those illegals. And I'm sorry to use the word, I'm I'm parroting them. What are messages that the left has reliably repeated in recent history to the point where they overtook popular culture and became, quote unquote, common sense. We heard them over and over. Love is love. Love makes a family. There was a time where everyone on earth, when we were still using Facebook with any regularity, changed their avatar to the rainbow. You remember that. That is a perfect example of engage the base in order to persuade the middle. What else? Fight for 15. That is a message that went from Seattle to the Bay Area to L.A., California, New York, at a time when the mainstream large economic groups said to those folks, I know, (laughs) because I do this for a living, you're nuts. We can't have a fight for 15. President Obama has come out in favor of $12 an hour. Presumptive nominee Hillary Clinton has come out for 12. If you ask for 15, let alone make it your top line message. You're going to sound like fools. You'll be laughed out of the room. That's more than double the present federal minimum wage of $7.25. No. And so those groups understanding that the job of a good message is not to say what's popular. It's to make popular what we need said, said, fine, you don't think this works as a national message. Cool. We're not going to fight with you. We're going to go find a spot where it works. And they prove the canard that nothing succeeds like success. And now 15 is the benchmark for most places when they are considering a minimum wage hike. That's sort of a go-to. And in point of fact, because of where populations are centered in this country, Americans mostly live in places where $15 an hour is in fact the minimum wage because between California and New York, that's where most people live. So negative messaging does have a role, but you have to give people something to vote for. Because otherwise, they're just going to sit at home, right? There's three candidates running in any race. There's your person, their person, and stay at home. And stay at home has the home team advantage because people are already at home. They don't need to do anything to get there. There has to be something to vote for. There has to be a sense that taking this action could yield some sort of result. Otherwise, why bother? And insofar as we are using negative messaging because... It is a mix. There is a role. We want that negative messaging, again, not to inspire fear, but rather defiance. Yeah. So I have a question that's from the other side, which is that so many popular things seem to go by the wayside when people have already been elected. How can those popular issues become more generative? Or how can we hold our elected officials more accountable? Like, What can we say to them so they can hear us? There is nothing, and I am the messaging lady saying this, against my own interests. This is how strongly I believe it. 
there's nothing that we can say that is as powerful as things that we do. So let's take a concrete for instance. Many people forget that the wave of teachers' strikes that overtook this nation in 2018 and led to the greatest organized labor movement that we have had in this country in, I don't know how many years, since like the era of creating OSHA and creating Social Security and creating labor protections. We had those educators' strikes, because it wasn't just teachers, it was also paraprofessionals, those educators' strikes. Where did that begin? It began in West Virginia. Yeah, that West Virginia, the Joe Manchin West Virginia, that that's the state I mean, not another one. That is where that movement began. It then went next to where? Oklahoma. And then after that, Arizona. And so what was happening there? What was happening there was that a group, a powerful force of educators were not just saying enough is enough. They were demonstrating it, right? The same principle holds with the summer of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd and the re-emergence of the Black Lives Matter protests. And, you know, it gives me incredible sadness to talk about it because it was such an incredible moment. And when we look at the present backlash against it right now, sitting where we are in 2022, it's heartbreaking. But when you look at public opinion around that time about BLM, about policing, about protest, about racial justice, we saw this sudden and measurably large surge in support for progressive ideas, in support of racial justice. You know, Ibram Kendi's book, bestsellers, people were going to book groups. America was, quote unquote, in this racial reckoning. I'm talking about it like this was 100 years ago, right? It sounds like I'm talking about, you know, Little House on the Prairie or something. That was because social proof is real. When you turn on the local news and you see people of different ages, different races, different backgrounds, out in the street saying, this isn't right, this isn't okay, this is what I believe, this is what I stand for, we need to make this a place where everyone can make it home safe, we need to make this a place where everyone can breathe, then you, middle American, for example, are like, huh, I guess this is what people like me think. I guess this is what is right, and I guess this is what is true. And that's what the right wing understands so completely well. That is why they keep their base engaged and enraged, so that they are going to the school board meeting, so that they are wearing the red hats, so that they are yelling and screaming. And so how do we hold our lawmakers to account? How do we make them pass our priorities? Well, first and foremost, and this is infuriating, I can go on all day about the Democrats in our caucus who not only betray their party, but betray our entire nation and our voters by being complicit in taking away people's freedom to vote and being complicit in allowing the GOP to sabotage our elections, basically to decide for themselves which voters they will heed and which they will silence. There isn't a theory of change. If there were, I'd be so down with it, wherein we win by talking shit about Democrats. If that were true, I'd be a happy lady. It's not. And so we need to keep attention and ire where it rightly belongs on this authoritarian faction, which is, in point of fact, how they're behaving. So what we should be doing is not because I think it will work, not because I think it will flip them. It's all about media. It's all about narrative. We should be asking Republicans. We should be showing up in front of their offices. We should be calling them. We should be mailing them. We should be creating media moments, because the media refuses to do it, in which we are saying to Republican lawmakers, why is it that you are taking away our freedoms? Why is it that you are trampling our rights? Why is it that you believe you get to pick and choose your voters? Because, hey, buddy, in America, we believe that voters pick our leaders. Leaders do not pick their voters. 
And we also believe that for democracy to work for all of us, it must include us all. We need to be doing those targeted things in order to demonstrate a larger narrative that actually this is what Americans want. This is what Americans believe. This is what Americans desire. This is where we stand. Mm hmm. Well, I guess we better go show up at those congressional offices standing in the hallways. Those have been very effective, for example, when they stood up for health care and wanted to make sure that they voted uh, to keep health care accessible, the Affordable Care Act. So towards the end of the interview, I always ask these two questions. Uh, so I'm going to ask you those two questions, and then I'm going to ask you a question about the questions, <laughs> a little bit meta. So the first question is, what are two things everyday people can do to basically be on point with the messaging? Yeah. Personally, at my shop, which is findable at asocommunications.com, every project that we work on, everything that we do, with rare exceptions, we make public. We believe, again, that if your words don't spread, they don't work. And so there are messaging guides. Um, we frequently partner with an organization called We Make the Future. You can also find incredible resources there, wemakethefuture.us. So you can look at those messaging guides. We have them on everything from the freedom to learn, which is how we make a full-throated case for equitable public education and confront these attacks on critical race theory. We have messaging guides on how to talk about revenue, how to talk about healthcare, how to talk everything under the sun. We also have ads, which you are welcome to take and post. We have memes, we have gifts, we have social media toolkits. So grab it, take it, use it. On the messaging side, I would also, at the risk of sounding kind of self-serving, that's kind of why I made my podcast. So that's what Words to Win By is supposed to function as. It's supposed to be functioning as a set of lessons on campaigns that we've won around the world and how we did it. There's also resources on the website for the podcast, messaging guides, ads that we ran. So you can also get stuff there. Excellent. And so the other question I always ask is, looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? A few things. Honduras, where my husband is from, you know, giant set of in-law family there, place that I care a whole lot about and lived. They just elected their first woman president ever. And she ran on an unabashedly democratic socialist, legalize abortion in a country where abortion is a criminal offense, pro-social progressive agenda. Incredible. Chile, same thing. Victories against right-wing authoritarianism, never complete, never enough. Looking at Brazil, for example, and their hopes and their aims to defeat their own Trumpian figure, Bolsonaro, their election is in October. I see forces in the world, and I do believe that these are global forces. The rise of Trump, the rise of Brexit, the rise of Boris Johnson, Orban, Duterte, Bolsonaro, the right wing in Australia, which has had a firm hold through, again, the same playbook as everywhere, right? Divide in order to conquer, oldest trick in the book. I do see the left globally, again, these are never complete, never enough, never fast enough, all the caveats, but getting better, getting smarter at confronting these tactics and being able to speak full-throatedly to our values, to what we believe. So that gives me hope. And the other thing, honestly, that gives me hope is that we had record turnout in 18 and 20. And so what we need to do in 22 is incredibly hard. Don't mistake me. The incumbent party usually takes a shellacking in the midterms. That is the historical pattern. And we're kidding ourselves if we're not real about that. But in contrast to previous midterms, this is the first time that we're going into a midterm having had this giant turnout. And what that means is that our task now is to return out. It's to get those folks who've done it once or who've done it twice to do it again, which is hard, but not as hard as turning never before voters into first timers. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly difficult. There are millions of people who've never voted and probably never will. So the meta question I wanted to ask you is that most people answer the questions with, you know, young people, young people make them hopeful. Uh, speaking about 
returning people out this year and 22, how do we get young people specifically to feel engaged enough to turn out this year? So one really critical thing is that, again, I said it before, social proof is real. And so what do I mean by that in this situation? I mean that understandably, we have a tendency to say things like, oh, young people really don't turn out, XYZ identity group are low propensity, this kind of category doesn't really vote in midterm elections. So we narrate our own problems. My frequent colleague from Frameshift, Maya Bordeaux, likes to remind people that the number one rule or a top rule in marketing is you don't tell people what keeps you up at night. You talk about your solutions to what keeps them up at night. So what keeps people in my position up at night? Young people aren't going to turn out. That keeps me up at night. That isn't a thing you say to young people. That is not your message. Because social proof is real. And so if you say, oh, young people are non-habitual voters, young people really don't vote, they vote in lower numbers, that actually measurably decreases participation. Because what you've said to them is oh, well, I'm a young person and that's what a person like me does. Okay. It it grants social permission to not. So what do you say instead? You say, young people are turning out in record numbers because that is actually true. Because when we increase turnout, we increase turnout <laughs> across, across the board. The board. So that, is a fact, that is a factual statement. I never make non-factual statements. I want to be very, very clear. Young people are turning out in record numbers, and you are the ones. You are the vital voters, which is a term I like to call the surge voters from 18 and 20. You are the vital voters that beat back an authoritarian faction that was trying to divide us. And in 22, you're going to do it again. You're going to take to the polls. You're going to take to the streets. And you're going to take to the halls of Congress to stand up with and for each other to make this a place where liberty and justice is for all. So you say to them, you did this thing and you message from inevitability. You don't say, if you do this, it'll be a lot better. If you participate in this way, we could have this. You fake it till you make it. You say, here's what you are going to do. Perfect. If there is maybe one takeaway you want us to have, what would it be? Say what you're for, say what you're for, say what you're for. What you fight, you feed. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. It was really a pleasure. Anat Shankar Osorio is the host of Words to Win By. Thank you. Thank you. Next time on Future Hindsight, we're joined by former Maine State Senator Chloe Maxman and her campaign manager, Canyon Woodward. They're co-authors of Dirt Road Revival, How to Rebuild Rural Politics and Why Our Future Depends on It, and founders of Dirt Road Organizing, a new nonprofit dedicated to rural organizing. That's next time on Future Hindsight. Did you know we have a YouTube channel? Seriously, we do. And actually, quite a lot of people listen to the show there. If that's you, hello. If not, You'll find punchy episode clips, full interviews, and more. Subscribe at youtube.com slash futurehindsight. This episode was produced by Zach Travis and Sarah Burningham. Until next time, stay engaged. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.